Father in heaven, we pray your spirit now as we open your word. Speak to us today. This is a, a remarkable story. Help us that maybe we will gain a slightly different insight on what grace in the storm can mean. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk to you about one of the adventure stories of the Bible. That's not necessarily what you think of when you think of the Bible all the time, but this really truly is an adventure story. And if you come into it with that, with that mindset, you'll easily recognize it as that. But I have to give you just a little bit of background for it to make sense. So this story, the main character in this story is Paul. Now, Paul is going to go on a voyage, but it's not going to be a voyage that ends well, at least for the ship. But you need to understand why he is going on this boat ride to begin with. And the reality is, Paul, on his last missionary tour that we read about, determines that he's going to make his way back to Jerusalem. And all along the way, on the way back, different prophets keep coming up to him and saying, uh, you are going to be bound when you get to Jerusalem. And everybody's saying, Paul, don't go, don't go. But Paul says, I can't, I have to go. The Spirit is compelling me to go to Jerusalem. So Paul goes to Jerusalem. He's there and he meets with the leaders there and they, they have this recommendation for him. Sometime we'll talk about that whole scenario. But anyway, Paul is walking in the temple one day and some of the Jews who are in Jerusalem for the feast from the province of Asia, likely from the city of Ephesus, recognize him. Because Paul spent uh, a couple years in Ephesus uh, teaching about Jesus and, and was very effective there. And they got very frustrated with him there. And in fact, there was, there was a whole riot there. And, and they, uh, they, they see him in Jerusalem and they say, this is the guy who's causing all the problems all around the world. And so the Jews in Jerusalem get in an uproar and there's a riot scenario that takes place. And they literally are about to kill Paul when the irony of the story, and these stories are always full of irony, aren't they? The irony of the story, the horrible oppressing Romans come and save Paul's life. Isn't that crazy how that goes? And, and it's a reminder to us, right, that God can use any means he wants to protect his people and to accomplish his purpose. And in this case, here he is, he's using the Romans. They come and they grab Paul. They take him out of there. And what transpires after this is a rather lengthy stay where Paul is in Caesarea and, and the Jews want him to come to Jerusalem. They want to kill him there. And, and Felix is there first. He's the Roman in charge. And then, then Festus comes. And one more time, they're trying to get him to Jerusalem. And Paul finally says, I appeal to Caesar. And Festus says, to Caesar you have appealed. To Caesar you will go. So now this next piece that we're going to read is the story, or at least the first part of the story, of the trip to Caesar. So let's start the story. It's Acts chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of, a ship of Adramitrium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. So, so Paul sets out on the ship. Not, it's not always that, that we need to see a map and we need to talk about weather when we're telling a Bible story. But we have to do that today, and it makes me very happy because I love maps and I love weather. So, so let's start with the map. Here we go. Paul sets out on his voyage. Now, this red line is going to represent the part of the story we're talking about today. He starts in Caesarea. They go up to Sidon, and, and Julius the centurion lets him meet with some of the people there inside and they give him supplies and things like that. But I want you to understand something about the status of Paul in this story. Paul is not an honored guest on the ship. You caught that part, right? Paul is not an honored guest on this ship. Paul is not even a happily paying customer on the ship. Paul is a prisoner. And you will notice at the beginning he's described Paul 
and some other prisoners. In fact, at the beginning of the story, he's not special at all. Now, Julius, for what other reason, grants, grants him uh, the right to get some help here. But at the beginning of this trip, Paul is nothing but a prisoner. All right, let's go on. Verse 4. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. All right, so let's go back. Back to the map here. They leave Sidon, and he says, because the wind was contrary, we sailed on the side of Cyprus that would protect us from the wind. So now this suggests to us they're trying to go west. The wind is contrary, so that means the general flow of the wind at this point is coming from the west, blowing back the other direction. So they skirted around Cyprus and tried to stay close to the coast as close as they could, because if you've ever sailed, sailing against the wind is kind of hard, isn't it? And that's important to remember in this story. This is not like our day where you just you get out there and you apply more steam and you go wherever you want to go. That's not how it worked. So the wind is against them and the trip is going slow. They arrive finally at the city uh, of Myra and then verse 6 again, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Canidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salome. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Okay, a lot of interesting information there. First of all, they're no longer on the original ship. So this is kind of like if you're trying to fly somewhere, you got on a plane, you went to Atlanta, then you got off your plane, you got on another plane. So what's happening here was the, the charge of the centurion is get these prisoners to Rome. So he found a ship that was going to the region of Asia, but it's not making very good time. And he finds another ship when they're in port that's going to Italy. And he says, okay, this is a direct flight. Let's get on this thing. So all the prisoners get off and get on this other ship, and they head out. But again, the wind is contrary. And it seems at this point there's a northerly component to this wind because they end up heading in a southerly direction. So let's pick it up again in verse 9. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. Now just pause right there because that's actually interesting data in this story. Because this little reference tells you exactly what time of year it is. The fast he's talking about is the Hebrew Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement comes late in the year, September into October. And in most part of the worlds that aren't Florida, we call September into October fall, right? And something happens in fall, doesn't it? The general southerly winds of summer give way to storms that come down from the north with the winds coming down more from the north and the northwest. And back in those days, if you were a journeyer out on the sea, there were seasons where you could travel and seasons where you could not because the wind became contrary. So the point that's being made here is it's late enough in the year that you can't get to Rome anymore by ship. Verse 9, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Men... I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest, and winter there." Now, you read that story, and it may not occur to you, so put yourself in the place of Julius. You're in charge of these prisoners, and one of the prisoners comes to you and says, it occurs to me that it's not wise for us to sail again. While over here, you have the owner of the ship and the helmsman who do this for a living saying, we really need to not stay here. We really need to go to this other port. Who are you going to listen to? See, this is one of the points you need to understand in this story. 
Paul is a nobody in this story. Maybe to us, he's always the celebrity of the story. But on this ship, Paul is a prisoner. And so not surprisingly, Julius looks at him kind of strange, like, why are you telling me this? And does what the helmsman and the owner think is best. Now here's a little aside I want to make on that. Maybe Paul knows a little more about sailing than they know. Because if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you will find a list of all these things that Paul has suffered through. And let me just read this verse. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 25. He's listing all of these things he went through. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. So this is not his first trip because that letter to the Corinthians was written before this voyage. Paul's been down three times and spent a day and a night in the water and he's like, yeah, bad idea, guys. But it's like, no, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'm going to listen to the other guy here. Here's a little side point. I want you to catch at this point. Learn to listen to all the voices in your life. You see, sometimes we're tempted to only listen to people who have standing and status and somehow are official to us or somehow we believe they know better and a voice comes to us from somewhere else and we're like, I don't even want to hear you. Be quiet. Okay, I'm not telling you to do everything everybody tells you, but I am saying sometimes the most unlikely voice will save you a lot of harm and a lot of loss. We need to be humble in our hearts and not dismiss information just because it's from somebody not important. Let's go on with the story. Back to Acts 27, verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon, and when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clotta, we secured the skiff with difficulty. So let's go back to the map for a second here. So here's what's happened. You know, sometimes in the winter, you'll get one of those kind of nice days. There's a little bit of a breeze coming up from the south. So they're thinking, this is a bad harbor. We want to get to Phoenix. It's on around the corner. It's not going to take us more than a day to get there. Here's this southerly wind. Surely this is going to hold up for at least a day. So they head out. But have you ever been in that scenario where you took a chance on the weather? Looked like it might be okay. You headed out, and by the time you got part way out there, it wasn't okay anymore? That's what happened to them. And suddenly the wind comes down, seemingly out of the north and out of the west, because they can't stay next to Crete anymore. The wind is blowing them out into the Mediterranean. And this is a big problem. Verse 17. When they had taken the skiff on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. This is amazing, that description there. The first day they just lightened the load of stuff that they thought maybe wouldn't matter. The next day they literally took the ship's tackle. That's the stuff you need to operate the ship. And threw it overboard... Because the storm was so bad, there was no chance they were going to be able to use it anyway. They're just hoping to survive. And after multiple days of it, they just kind of give up on hope. Have you ever been in a ship in a, in a bad storm? So I was, uh, the closest I can get to this was, was one time I was uh, with Alicia and we were on a, on a ferry crossing from France to England. And it was a day we should not have been in the English Channel. And the ship was going up and down. It actually was a night is what it was, which made it worse. And, the, and the, the transit took almost six hours. We were going a longer distance, and it was really slow because of the weather. 
and pretty much everybody on board the ship had long lost all of their French cuisine long before <laughs> we got to England. It was misery. It was just six hours. And it was a bigger ship than this. Can you imagine that experience? To where the crew with their own hands is throwing the things they need to operate the ship into the ocean, just hoping to survive? So Paul at this point is, still does not have very high status, although maybe some people are looking at him a little bit like, you, you said something about this, right? Verse 21, But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. It's hard for any of us not to say I told you so, right? Yeah. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong. I love that line. Do you like that line? The God to whom I belong. Is there a God to whom you belong? Do you belong? The God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, what stands out to me as I read that is that, is that phrase there that there'll be no loss of life, which at this point, they'd given up even on that hope. But, but why does Paul say this? Did you catch this, verse 24? Let's go back. I want to highlight this. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So, God is, uh, so Paul is on mission. And God is determined that he must stand before Caesar. Therefore, his days will not end until he has accomplished everything the Lord has appointed him to do. What I want to suggest to you is that's true for every one of you. When you are on mission for God, you can trust your days will not end until you have completed the task he's given you. Now, that may seem strange to us. We may not be able to understand it, but it's a faith statement to believe that God will accomplish through us everything he's appointed. And Paul says, that's the deal. I got to go to Caesar. But here's the amazing thing. Not only is God going to preserve Paul and take him to Caesar, also everyone on the ship will be spared because Paul is God's man, and because of that, God is extending grace to them as well. Just because a man on mission is there, the grace of God spread to them all. The presence of a believer on mission can save the lives of even the unbelievers. The ship is full of unbelievers. Yet because Paul was there, God granted them grace. Don't ever think you don't make a difference. Every time you walk out that door, because of your presence in the world, God's grace comes to unbelievers. Just being there, every day of your life matters. We'll come back to that, but I want to finish, I want to finish the story. Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come, <laughs> can you imagine even a storm going on that line? What in the world is this? Now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. That's a fascinating line to me because I'm not a, I'm not a man of the sea. I would have no idea if I was anywhere near land or anywhere near nothing. But somehow when, you, when you're that invested in something, you know these things. And something about the water or the waves or something said to them in the night, we're getting close to land. Verse 28, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. 
And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. They're afraid. The sailors are afraid. Now, I looked up fathoms. A fathom is six feet, according to the reverence I had. So, so it went from 120 feet to 90 feet. And they're thinking, nah, that's not good. So they throw the anchors off and pray for morning. Now, a, a change has come to Paul's status. He gets on the ship, nothing more than a prisoner. Midway through, he gives advice that's ignored that turns out to be true. Later, he says, I have good news for everybody. You're all going to live because I'm here and God has a purpose for me. His status is changing. And I want you to see what's going to happen next here. And, And the point of that is, don't worry about who you are or what your station is because God can accomplish through you anything he needs. You can even be a prisoner on the ship. And God will turn you. Well, let's just see what happens. Verse 30. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, ah, they didn't really have the women and children first spirit about them, did they? Then uh, as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. And there it is. That's the beginning of the tension between the army and the navy. That's where it started, right there. Do you see what's happening here? Do you remember what Julius, the centurion, did the first time Paul gave him advice? He said, yeah, whatever, I'm going to trust these guys. Do you see what happened the second time Paul gave him advice? If you don't keep these guys on board, we're not going to make it. What did he tell the soldiers to do? Cut the lines, do it now, Paul says. See how his status has changed? See what God can do? Verse 33, and as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. And in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Now, I want you to appreciate this moment. Now, Paul has gone from from prisoner to ignored advice giver to, yeah, we really should have listened to you, and now you're telling us we're going to be saved because you're here to Julius doing what he said, to now he's the host of the experience. Do you see this? He stands up, he says, gentlemen, you need to eat something. There may have been ladies there too, it's not specific. 276, that's a good group. You need to eat something. Everybody take heart. He prays to the Lord, he breaks the bread, they all receive the food and everyone is encouraged. There is a power when we share a meal together, isn't there? And that's the whole point of the whole tailgate picnic. That's why we're doing this. There's a power to the experience of sharing a meal together. And so Paul leads out in a, you know, it's almost a little communion service of sorts. I guess they probably didn't have any any decent grape juice at this point. But nonetheless, they share the meal. But there's one more twist in this story. Verse 33. Oh, I read that. Verse 39. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors, so they just cut them loose, and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. I mean, this is just... 
just let her go. They cut the anchors off, they put the sail up, and they just hoped. Verse 41, but striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. So now they're on a sandbar. And the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. Now, now here's, here's the, the, the moment of danger. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. Why was that their plan? Do you remember the Roman rules? If you're in charge of a prisoner and he escapes, it's your life. If your prisoner gets away, you die. So the soldiers are doing the rational thing, right? Oh, well, I'm not sure we can keep them all. Let's kill them all. But look what happens. Look what happens. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on board, some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Why did the prisoners survive? Because Paul was there and because the centurion wanted to save him. See, this is the impact you can have in the world. Your presence can lead to the saving of others who are completely unworthy, right? I mean, they're prisoners. Surely they did something wrong, right? But because Paul was there. See, here's the thing. When you live the gospel in the world, the world is blessed because God's grace flows through you even to those who are unworthy. That's how it works. Paul writes about this. You go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul is describing he and Silas, but it's applicable really to all of us. He says, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So you hear what Paul is saying? God sends us out, and the fragrance of the goodness of God goes everywhere we go. Verse 15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So here's what he's saying. We go out and everything we do is sincere to be on mission and doing the purpose for God. And when we do that, the grace of God comes through us to everyone we encounter. And I want to suggest to you the exact same thing is true in your life. And in a world right now that is in desperate need of some grace of God, could it be one of the reasons there's so little of it is we don't understand that we are the presence that's supposed to bring it everywhere we go? If every one of us, every time we left our house, kept in mind that everywhere we go we have the opportunity to reveal the grace of God in everything we do, even the hard stuff, Do you think the world would be a different place? This is what happens when you're faithful. I want to take you over two more chapters to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. And this is a challenge I want to give you, and this is a hard challenge. Sometimes when we leave our houses, it's easy to regard people in a very worldly way, isn't it? Without grace in our hearts and without love. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone... Who does this apply to? If anyone is in Christ, he, she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. But that's not where it ends, is it? It goes on. What happens? And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Every time we go into the world, our task is to help the world be reconciled to God. He's given that to us. Now then, we are ambassadors. Who do you represent? Jesus Christ the Lord. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Every time you leave your house, your life matters and it doesn't matter your station you can be a prisoner on the ship but the grace of god will flow through you to everyone there if you're willing status doesn't matter paul the prisoner becomes paul the reason everyone survives you are the ambassador you bring the aroma of the goodness of God and through you God's grace flows to the world let's pray father in heaven it's it's too much for us it's more than we deserve it's it's more than we can ever execute but yet you have said I have given you gifts and I have sent you into the world as my ambassador. Lord, when we think grace in the storm, we mean, Lord, deliver us from the storm. But are you saying to us today that we can be the grace in someone else's storm? Help us, Lord, to live the gospel in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.